Symphonia number two in C minor. This is really a, one of the most beautiful, I think, of all of the symphonias. And I've done a lot of work breaking this piece down and trying to understand it myself. First of all, it's a canon. It starts with the two measure phrase for the soprano, and then exactly two measures later, the next voice comes in the alto, answering identically just an octave below. So let's take that first two measure subject and see what it sounds like. And this is in 12-8 time, so we have 12 beats in measure 1 and 12 beats in measure 2. So 24 beats for this two measure subject. That's the first measure. Counted it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one. The next measure comes the alto. Absolutely identical. So we have a symphonia with three voices, but we only hear two at the beginning of this piece. Now what Bach does with the counter subject, I find absolutely remarkable. I'd like to play that for you in measure one. The bass begins with the counter subject, like this. Now, I'd love to sing that part if it's three-part harmony, and that's one of the things I ask myself is this an interesting and beautiful subject, or is this pretty much serving as filling the space with maybe not as prominent of a part? But this is extremely you know, holding its own, and I see these as two pillars of equal strength. And this, is, this is a dance, a stately dance of respectful and equal partners. Let's take a look at this uh, counter subject of measure three and four, which we have in the soprano. It's different than the counter subject we heard in measures one and two. Falling third. And up a fifth. Isn't that nice? You know what he's doing there? He's taking the harmonic outline, our key of C minor, and taking the triad. Starting on the third. Third. This piece has falling intervals, broken intervals. Climbing up the fifth. Now, speaking of these broken intervals, our subject and counter subject both have the broken octave. And this is a great time for me to show you the first of five different pages that you get with your chart which you can actually get through the digital downloads from my website, sallychristianmusic.com. This is included. I spent uh, a long time preparing this, really weeks and weeks, to get this information called down to the basic nuggets, which I think are essential in following and understanding how this piece is all put together. So what I did is to take my opening four measures, in the soprano here, and then my same opening four below it. I put a big margin here so I have room to write all of the things that are going on here. So the common elements here, we have the broken octave. The soprano has the descending G octave in measure one. The bass has the ascending C octave. 
So that's already giving us our tonic and dominant. Do you see how balanced these are? The second common element is the broken seventh, which we get in the soprano of measure two. And in measure one, we get that, the counter subject, here. See, going in the other direction. One's going up, the other's falling. Beautiful, if you even put those together. Sounds almost like Beethoven there. I hear that as a Beethoven harmony. And then we have harmonic and melodic scale writing. Harmonic minor is used all the time. The raised seventh, the B natural. That's not unusual, it's very common. But to see the melodic minor used is not as common. And there we get it in the counter subject of measure two, right here. to tell you what each of these two parts, the subject and the counter subject, offer that's unique to them. And right here with our measure two counter subject, what do we have? Rhythmically. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. What do we have? Long, short, long, short, long, short, long. First time we've had that. And that's going to play prominently in the piece. That's actually iambic pentameter. Short, long, short, long, short, long is what that is. And the last element is the very opening measure in the subject. Soprano. Now what is that? It is broken inversions. This is the second inversion. This is the, first, the root position. And if we had first inversion, we would have... And I can't help but tipping my hand a little bit here. We do get this one later on in the piece. It's just stellar writing to include it the way he does, where he does. Okay. I will come back to this because when we get to our second motive of the piece, all of those elements that I just discussed are going to apply, and then two more new ones. So let's take a look now at our... I'm going to play this one more time now, as written, from the top. Listen for the harmonic minor, listen for the broken octaves, listen for the sevenths, and the harmonic and melodic scales. Lots of things to track. Listen for the balance between the two parts. Breathe. these titles. You can make up any title you want, but it really helps me to identify with what is e the essential character in this part of the piece. What does it mean to me? How can I 
get into that deeper meaning of this beneath the notes themselves. So we have now the entrance for the first time of the third voice, so we are having a trio at this point in measure five. With our falling motive, and then it's a sequence. It plays again in the next measure, just dip down a step. I think that's so beautiful, that's why I called it the falling motive. And it's based on the first part of the subject. The set, if you broke that one down, it would be up a sixth and up a fifth. Ascending sixth, ascending fifth. Now if you invert that, you would get... So he is inverting it, but he's changing it. It's an altered. He's doing... How different that sounds. That seventh is all the difference in the world. Now with <clears throat> the bass part coming up just like the opening subject within the instead of like it did in measure one, it does this. Are you ready? How can you think of that? And then in here is amazing. So you put those together. But I said there were three voices. Where is that third voice? Well, it's right here. we have the appearance of 16th notes. It's the alto part. It's tricky because it's shared between the two hands. So if I put everything together there at the beginning of my second system, Extended trill. Now the original music just shows an open dotted half note here, but anytime we have such a long note just holding, we wouldn't even hear it anymore. It dies away. But by putting the trill there, it holds the space. It also adds a little color, and I think it actually brings in the emotional component of, of a fluttering heart, something vibrating with excitement. You know, there's energy in a trill. It's not just a stagnant note. So listen how beautiful, and I do use a little bit of pedal for the trill to warm it up. I'm trying to use very little pedal in this piece, but with the trills you need a little bit. Here it is in measure seven. <laughs> time now for me to bring you to your ornamentation addendum which comes with the chart. This long extended trill comes three times in the piece and this is all written out for you to see exactly how you can uh, learn that it's called a measured trill. So you can study from this. The first one and the second one Looking at that first trill in measure seven, look at the supporting part. Does that sound familiar? Yes, it is. It's opening one motive. But changes. Well, that's the E flat major scale, isn't it? Beautiful. And that's exactly where we're going to E flat major. Let's start that trill again.
it's a good time to show you the final piece of paper that you get is the satellite view. I just love this satellite view that I'm going to show you. You know I re-engraved this and this doesn't look like any other music that you can purchase because it's never been done before like this. And what I did is to divide the piece into the sections that it is based on these different motives. So if I look at the beginning of each one of these things I call systems, the beginning of System 1, I've got the subjects here in red. Then our second falling motive is a sequence, and that's in blue. And it comes again here, it comes again here, and at the close. And this one begins on the 1, remember this is 12-8 time. This one begins on the 7th beat this sequence right here and this one as well. Where we are in the piece right now is the same subject that we had at the beginning now in the dominant G minor key. But it begins on the seventh beat. So this whole system here is the exact length as our opening four measures. Two and two, two and two, but the difference here is, which you can clearly see here, we start with the half measure going to here, and this starts mid-measure, going to here. So everything is offset by a half a measure, by seven beats. So this starts here, and I think this is important, I don't know that the ear can distinguish it, but you certainly understand how complex this is as a composition by understanding it. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one, two, three, four, five, six. I want to point out that's very important. You know, Bach was writing these things so that we could understand counterpoint and that we would play it correctly. In other words, articulating the three different obligato parts, that means non-negotiable, they all need to be there, in a way of terrace dynamics so we can hear all three parts at the same time. Particularly important, it is right here with this G minor. That's the Isn't that beautiful? He's reaching out here. Coming together. Now, here is the point. The soprano gets our subject. the bass and the alto alone because you really don't even know it's there unless you look carefully. Here it is, alto and bass. And now let me put it with the soprano subject and hear how that all blends together so harmoniously. And you have to let go. One, two, three, on the third beat of the A, and four, five, six. You have to let go of the F sharp. These are the details that make the piece right, and it's only beautiful when it's perfect. Sorry if I sound a little passionate about this, but these are the details. You don't want to be sloppy about it. Okay, let's go on now to the beginning, right there of the sub soprano subject. Here's the second falling mode of sequence, system four. articulated. It's got to be just, a, just filling the sound like a tremor. Clear G minor arrival. 
survival. The dialogue there, one more thing before we leave page one, I'd like to play these soprano and alto together as redistribution. And this is the beginning here, measure 16. Do you hear that beautiful, staggered, broken third dialogue between the soprano and the alto? And underneath the bass with this first time extended 16th note melody. G minor, top of page two. We are going to have our subject now, but it changes. G minor. Oh my. This is a diminished chord. How different then of the opening. You can use a little pedal here if you want, just to give the mystery. this down now on page two. Now I put colors all the way through in my working two-page copy. Yours does not come with colors on the working copy. It's, I think, better just to see it in black and white and really learn your notes. You can add these colors if you want in colored pencil. I always use pink for soprano turquoise for tenor alto and green for bass. It's just I like the color combination together. The satellite view will come with some color. Okay, so now I want to look at the bass. Starting at the top of page two. Listen to this long, long melody. writing. Underneath that now we have the same. Let's take a look at the other remaining two parts and what they do. Alto. You know that. The third. It's our falling motive but altered. Minor third, minor fifth. So there is just really beautiful. Oh, so beautiful. Now going on here at this pivotal point, that's just, just my favorite part in the entire piece. Here's the first inversion. voices. Here we are with redistribution uh, at this half measure, the second half of measure 22, your system 2. I mean, 
we count this, this starts on the offbeat. This is one of those half measure beginnings. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now that may not sound like much to you, but if you treat this as a meditation of utter simplicity and listen to the sadness of this, I'm not going to count because it's suspended. Underneath it, we are bass. This is a sequence. He's going to do it three times. Putting that all together here, E flat major. system with this marvelous descending continuous melodic 16th note line where all three parts share in the long line. The pink soprano, the turquoise tenor, and then joined with the bass. And it's a seamless passage. When you hear this, you don't know that those are three different voices all sharing in the beauty. Start it again. This is soprano. Now here's tenor or alto, they're interchangeable. And bass. It's climbing the bass. Those are the steps. close of the piece with our falling motive. But this time, he doesn't give us the falling seventh. Soprano, measure 28. Before. Our measure five had exactly the same pattern, except it was up an octave. With the falling seventh, remember that? Both hands, soprano and bass, fell. Here, listen to the difference. The bass is down an octave with the same pattern. Our Let's put those together. So different than next measure. Measure twenty nine ends with a third. Let's go back to our measures. Five and six again. This is actually extremely ingenious what Bach is doing for our clothes to make such an amazing reference 
to the very first appearance of all three voices. So here, let me play this again in measure five with just the soprano and the bass in the original opening. You see, they both fell by the seventh. Now we have... Third, but it's the same material. We have the third voice, then the alto. The first time he shared between the hands with our sixteenth note writing, like this. And the next measure. He takes it all still with the alto in measure 28, but with the right hand only. Let's listen. Is it the same material? It is exactly. Now the next measure, instead of dropping here, Bach goes up the octave and takes it with the soprano. But it's identical. Let me show you now one more visit with our satellite view, the color version. Remember I showed you that our falling motive was in the blue box here as a sequence, what I've just played with the falling sevenths. Now here at the end of the piece, our last system, we have the same sequence, same key, same notes. But there is one crucial difference. Before we leave this, look at the length here. Look at the length here. Oh, this is your color version. You also get your black and white version, which is very nice because you can make your own marks and your own colors if you want. So let me show you what Bach has done with the bottom voice in measure 28 to close. This is just a miracle. is he's trying to break out of this really kind of desolate mood we've had for almost two and a half minutes of searching and inquiring and questioning and we're almost ready to close the piece how is he going to end so let me put the parts all together now by the way that ascending fourth line in the Bach uses a lot. It's the ascending fourth, which is really the reverse of the circle of fifths. He uses it as a modulatory tool. So this is what enables him to make the new tapestry of our last system. Let me play it now as written. our third trill. Our first trill made it to the A flat major with a little sunlight, but this one isn't. This is... Now watch what I'm doing with my middle voice, the alto here.
make it. We made it to C major. We escaped the minor. We broke free at the very end. And when I play this piece, it is to me very much like that. This piece has become a metaphor for me, for my life. And uh, it's given so much sustenance to me. You know, we all have these chapters of turbulence as in the human condition. It's built in. You're going to have times when you're really up against it. And what do you do? Who do you turn to? What do you replace the sorrow with so you keep going? And I turned to this piece every day I played it many times in a row. And every time I came to the end, I said, thank you. Thank you, because Bach gave this to us, gave it to all of humanity for all time, so that we would have something of incredible spiritual value. Remember, Bach did write for the glory of God. And when I play this piece, I do feel surrounded by a higher energy, a greater intelligence, through the mind of Bach and the heart of Bach. And this is what's available for you when you play this beautiful C minor sinfonia. I've really enjoyed sharing it with you, and thank you very much.